Thank you for coming. Today we have a couple of very interesting seminars. They are all um, sort of centered in um, around material science. And um, we will have, uh, the first one will be a little bit more experimental and uh, the second one theoretical. There will be like a break in between. So we can, we can have coffee outside and you can approach the speakers if you want. Um, it is my pleasure to, to introduce the first speaker, uh, Luke Wally. He comes from Deakin University, from the Institute of uh, for Frontier Materials uh, in Australia. He did his PhD in Australia as well, in physics. And uh, he's, uh, he's an expert in, um, in analyzing and characterizing materials, in particular in uh, SPM and, uh, and other probe techniques. And, um, Particularly remarkable of his career is, is that he's one of the biggest uh, experts in HVM, in uh, boron nitrate, in the very different forms that it can, uh, that it can present. Anything from uh, nanotubes, where he did his PhD already, so it has been a long career related to, to HVM. And uh, I guess that, that he's going to, to present us uh, many more aspects of this, of this very interesting material in his talk. So, so thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. So uh, I really appreciate everyone's uh, kind invitation so that I have the chance to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Lu Hua Li. Uh, I'm from Deakin University at the Institute for Frontier Materials. And today, my talk will be mainly on the uh, properties and application of uh, hexagonal boron nitride nanosheets. Uh, first, First, some uh, uh, introduction, brief introduction on Australia, because Australia is quite a far away place. So, so basically, we are in Victoria State, so where the Melbourne is located. And uh, Deakin University has uh, four campuses. Uh, one of the campuses uh, is located in the close to the CBD of Melbourne. That's mainly for the undergraduate education. And uh, we have two campuses located uh, in Geelong. Geelong is here. It's about 70 kilometers away, uh, west of Melbourne. It's a one-hour drive. We have two campuses here. We are close to the Corio Bay. So, show here. So, where is the president of uh, the university? I, I think she's the office is located at uh, the very top uh, story of the building, so she can have a very uh, like the bird view of the whole bay, very nice view. And uh, we are located uh, uh, here, it's called Wong Pong's campus. And this campus uh, focuses mainly on the biology, uh, medicine, uh, engineering, new materials. We also have a kind of a little bit uh, far away campus. So this is about two and a half hours drive. So here is close uh, to the shore, so uh, the marine science, or some agriculture is based here. So basically, we are here. Here is uh, our city, and the campus is probably somewhere here. Uh, actually, we are quite lucky because we have very beautiful uh, views or sceneries around our campus. So this is a uh, very beautiful, the Great Ocean Road. So actually, I took this photo. So this is a very famous 12 episodes. So it's about about um, three, four hours drive. Uh, and also winery is quite famous, and also a lot of interesting animals. Because kangaroo is so popular, so uh, common in Australia, so I, I don't show here. <laughs> so this is an institute for frontier materials. So we have about 250 staff and students, so mostly uh, uh, the postgraduate PhD or master research-based students. Uh, we have two laureate fellows. It's kind of uh, the, the top honor for scientists in Australia, and their salary is very high. It's around two hundred eighty thousand Australian dollars per year. So, uh, our focuses are mainly on metal, uh, nanometer materials, corrosion, polymer, fiber, and energy materials. Uh, actually, metal and uh, fiber are two emphasis of the institute. Uh, for the fiber, uh, we study, for example, natural fiber, the cotton, the wool, uh, and also some synthetic fibers, for example, carbon fiber. 
And we have a quite a unique facility for carbon fiber production. So we have a kind of a, a miniaturized <coughs> automatic production of carbon fiber. So the purpose is that we can do fundamental research using these facilities. And also, we attract industries. For example, for industry, they want to improve their uh, recipe, the process, and we provide the facility exactly the same as they use in the, uh, in the industrial process. So that they, can, they don't need to stop their, their production, and they can come to test all the things they, they want, for example, so for several months. And then the purpose is, after that, they can directly get the user experience at Deacon and uh, for the in industrial application. So that facility, I think, costs around uh, 100 million Austrian dollars. So it's around uh, uh, 17 or 18 million uh, euros. Oh, no. So it's, uh, no, should it be like, like a 70, 70, sorry, should it be 70 million euros, maybe around that. <coughs> And uh, our facilities, I think, are quite good. We have three TEMs. One of it, one of them, uh, with quantum mills. We have four field emission SEMs with uh, FIB, EDX, uh, and EBSD. Uh, one atom probe plus a laser, so that cost uh, more than two million Austrian dollars. Uh, three solid NMR, so that's also quite unique. I think that cost three million Austrian dollars. Uh, we have SPM and a lot, a lot of uh, the fundamental. Uh, research equipment as well. So now let's talk about brown nitride. So just like its carbon counterpart, brown nitride can also form uh, the monolayer nanosheets, the ribbon, and the nanotube. Uh, so during my research, I studied uh, all of these materials, but today let's focus on the atomically thin brown nitride. <coughs> let's start from the basics. So just like graphene, high-quality brown nitride nanosheets can be mechanically exfoliated using uh, the tape method, the scotch tape method. And uh, here shows an uh, optical and FM image of monolayer and few-layer brown nitride. And uh, their interlayer distance is quite similar to that of graphite or graphene. Uh, Raman spectroscopy has been proven uh, one of the most useful characterization methods for carbon materials. However, there is some difference between brown nitride and graphene in terms of rubber. For brown nitride, uh, so it only shows the rubber G band, but not the rubber D band, due to the lack of uh, uh, the core anomaly. However, I found that there is still uh, some G band shift with a reduction of the thickness. So as shown here, with the reduction of brown nitride thickness from bulk to monolayer, there is a obvious uh, increase in the G-band frequency. And here shows uh, the width of the G-band, and also there is an increase. Um, actually, uh, we are the second report on the uh, Raman spectroscopy of uh, monolayer and few layer brown nitride. Unfortunately, our results are quite different from those reported from University of Manchester. So what they found out was that uh, from double uh, to failure brown nitride, there was an increase in the uh, Raman G-band. However, for monolayer brown nitride, they observed a decrease in the frequency compared to the bulk. So I'm quite curious why there was uh, this kind of discrepancy uh, from the different groups because we kind of using the same brown nitride source and we use similar method for exfoliation and uh, then we started more about Raman about uh, atomic thin brown nitride so as I shown in the previous slides uh, for example if the brown nitride is sitting on silicon oxide and then there is a obvious uh, increase in the Raman frequency However, if we produce or we suspend the brown nitride over the hole, like here, so these are suspended brown nitride, and then we found that uh, there's almost no change in the Raman G-band frequency, uh, regardless, in, in regardless of the thickness of brown nitride. 
And then with the help from Elton, so Elton and, uh, and I had a lot of collaboration uh, in, uh, in the broad large part field and also you will see a lot of uh, Elton's contribution in the talk. So what we found is that uh, according to the, to the, to the uh, DFT calculation, there was no dramatic change in the uh, Raman frequency for brown nitride of uh, different signals. So only for the model layer, there's a very, very slight change. So then theoretically, there shouldn't be like dramatic change in the Raman frequency, no matter how thick the brown nitride is. <coughs> and, uh, and then we further, uh, in the further study, we heat the brown nitride on silicon oxide substrate. And with the heating, we observed a further increase in the Raman frequency. So why is that? So that means, theoretically, there shouldn't be <coughs> much difference. However, we observed uh, the brown nitride uh, bound to silicon oxide. There was an increase. So that actually is mainly caused by the strain introduced by the substrate. However, for the suspended brown nitride, they are kind of uh, strain-free. So that means uh, we didn't see much difference in the Raman frequency. <coughs> okay, so uh, when I talk to people that uh, are many working on boron nitride, and uh, the first question I normally get uh, is uh, like, uh, what are the special properties of, of boron nitride, and how can we use these materials? So later I will. Uh, introduce to you some differences between brown nitride and graphene and in some cert certain cases it's better to use brown nitride instead of graphene. So the first difference or advantage of uh, atomic facing brown nitride over graphene is that uh, for graphene, uh, monolayer graphene they started to uh, uh, oxidation at around 300 degrees in air so they are not very uh, thermally stable. However, for boron nitride, here shows a monolayer boron nitride on silicon oxide. After 850 degrees uh, heating in air, two hours, so I, I didn't observe uh, much morphology change. So that means for the boron nitride, even for monolayer, they are somewhat stable to around 800 degrees. And uh, for the double and three layers, they are stable to 850 degrees. And uh, according to our uh, Raman, uh, spectroscopy, we found that for the monolayer bone nitride, they start to oxidize at uh, around uh, to, to get uh, uh, oxygen doping at around 700 degrees. And for double and three layers, the temperature was around 850 degrees. So that means the bone nitride is much more thermally stable than graphene. And then, how can we use that? So one example shown here is that uh, people uh, have proposed to use graphene to protect metal surfaces because there are several advantages of graphene for this purpose. Uh, one is that graphene is quite strong. Second, it, ha it, it is quite impermeable to uh, the water or the gas molecules. Uh, however, there is a, like a one critical uh, problem for graphene, for this purpose, is that graphene is uh, electrical conductive. So if we put graphene on top of a metal, so we have two conductors here, so they could form galvanic cell. So in the long term, the so graphene can enhance the surface corrosion of the metal surface. Uh, the different, for a uh, uh, bone nitride is different, it, is, it has a wide uh, band gap around 6 eV, so that means brown nitride, even for the monolayer, it is an electrical insulator. So that means brown nitride is also quite strong, it has similar impermeability as graphene. The difference is brown nitride, they won't uh, enhance <coughs> the corrosion of the metal surface, and also brown nitride is more thermally stable. So uh, we test the CBD grown brown nitride on metal on copper surface and the thickness of the brown nitride is about 6 nanometer and we did two groups of uh, corrosion studies so one is uh, 
uh, in the solution. And uh, according to the OCP TEFL studies, so there is a clear, clear protection of the brown nitride over the, the copper. And also, we did a high temperature uh, oxidation test. And here shows uh, uh, the bare copper without uh, the protection of brown nitride. And just uh, after two hours of uh, heating in air at 250 degrees, the surface become very dark. So that means the formation of the copper oxide. However, as shown here, with the protection of brown nitride, the surface still has uh, the metal uh, last, luster. So that means, basically, the copper was not oxidized. And according to EDX, with the protection of brown nitride, uh, the oxidation of the copper reduced about 90%. So it's quite effective. However, if you look closely at the optical image of the copper with brown nitride, you can still see a lot of dark areas. So this area is about 40% of the total surface of copper. So these areas means uh, the copper quite like protected, but this area quite oxidized. So why is that? We had some further studies. So here is a like enlarged optical image of the copper with uh, brown nitride after oxidation. Here shows a SEM image. So the dark area here corresponding to this area. So that means the formation, you can see a lot of uh, the formation of the copper oxide particles. And uh, this area corresponding to this uh, copper color area. So it's quite like a flat. So that means the copper is protected. And then why is that? Uh, first, I try to use Raman to uh, determine the quality of the CVD brown nitride to see whether the quality was homogeneous or not. However, you know, for brown nitride, it's a Raman uh, signal is quite weak, and especially for brown nitride or copper, almost no Raman signal. So it was not helpful at, helpful at all. And then I turned to another technique, it's called conductive AFM. So what a conductive AFM uh, does is that you have a conductive cantilever, and then you can apply voltage uh, through the cantilever, uh, go through the sample, and then you can measure the current going through. So you can measure how conductive the sample is. So here shows the AFM uh, surface morphology of the copper with brown nitride. Here is a deflection image. So you can see there are like a, basically three structures. One is a, a relatively flat areas. You can see some ripple-like structure and also some disc-like structure on the surface. And uh, this is a conductive AFM image. So the bright area, so that means there is a much higher current going through. So that means the bright area is more conductive. And, uh, this uh, dark blue area, there's almost no current, so that means this area is insulating. And then we can overlap the deflection image and the conductive FM image. You can see that uh, this area and uh, this area, uh, they are much more electrical conductive than this area. And uh, co coincidentally, you can see this area, there are a lot of dislike structure. However, in this area, there are a lot of ripples. So if we come back to the SEM image, you can see that the oxidation mainly happens around the disk area, and the ripple area is kind of intact. So that means brown nitride uh, is intrinsic, uh, should be uh, electrically insulating. However, with the defects or the doping, brown nitride could be more conductive. So that means this Bright and dark area means a different quality of brown nitride. So that means good quality brown nitride is really good in the protection of the metal surface. However, for the low quality, so it's not so effective. So that means we really need, for this application, we really need a high quality brown nitride. And more recently, we found another unique property of atomically thin brown nitride. As shown here, so these are the AFM image of this is a monolayer brown nitride, double layer brown nitride, 
and the bulk brown nitride on silicon oxide. So if we compare the results here, this is uh, uh, on, the, on the same silicon substrate with brown nitride of different thickness. We immersed the sample into R6G uh, solution for 300 seconds. And you can clearly see that for the atomic thin brown nitride, there are a lot of surface absorption of the molecules compared to that of the bulk. So in other words, we find that atomic thin brown nitride, they are much more uh, like an effective or efficient in the surface absorption of arom aromatic molecules. Then why is that? That's very interesting. So we did a DFT calculation, and here is a R6G molecule on a one layer, single layer of brown nitride. And if we release both the molecule and the brown nitride, we can see that the molecule does not experience much morphology change. It's quite similar to the study molecule. However, the brown nitride experienced uh, morphology change. This change is called a conformational change. And uh, with a conformational change, we can see uh, the simulation induced, uh, the simu simulation uh, calculated surface morphology change and also the change of the strength in the, in the nanosheet. So because of the conformational change, so it can greatly increase the surface absorption energy and efficiency. So this is a quite unique phenomenon uh, for brown nitride because before people observed conformational change normally in the molecule but not in the substrate. But because of the atomically uh, thickness of brown nitride, so it's very, very flexible, it's more flexible than the molecule itself. So that means in this case, the molecule has no morphology change, however, the brown nitride has. So this is a, a, a calculation, uh, the, exp uh, the explanation from the calculation, but how can we experimentally uh, approve that? So there are two things we need to do. So the first thing, we need to see how the molecule are touched or interact with uh, brown nitride. So for this purpose, we use the uh, angular dependent nexus. So using the Australian synchrotron. So we shine X-ray uh, 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 X-ray on the brown nitride uh, absorbed with the molecule at a different instant angles, as shown here. And then you can clearly see there is some change in the carbon one S uh, nexus spectrum. So according to some uh, like a simple uh, mathematical calculation, and also we can see that uh, the different subbands have a different uh, tendency uh, under different X-ray incidents, and then we can we can show that uh, the R6G molecule is mainly in the so-called lying down absorption uh, position on the brown nitride. So first uh, we prove that the molecule uh, tends to absorb our brown nitride in this way. So it's totally consistent to the simulation. Okay, the next step is more challenging, is how can we experimentally visualize the small conformational change in the brown nitride, because the change is quite small. <coughs> and then we use the Raman spectroscopy. As I showed before, if we have a brown nitride sitting on silicon oxide because of the substrate uh, interaction and the cause of strain. So the average G band frequency of this kind of substrate bound brown nitride is at the higher frequency or energy. However, for suspended brown nitride, because it's almost strain free, and then its G band energy is at a lower <coughs> position. Okay. So these are the initial <coughs> uh, frequencies. And then we absorb some molecules on the substrate bound and suspended uh, brown nitride. We found uh, an interesting uh, opposite tendencies. For the substrate bound brown nitride, after the absorption of the molecule, we observed a decrease in the G band frequency. In contrast, for the suspended brown nitride, we observed 
increase in the G-band frequency. So why was that? As shown here, for the substrate bond bond nitride, it had it has a lot of strain due to the substrate, and then because of the surface absorption of the molecule, that actually reduced uh, the strain in the membrane. So that means we observe a downshift of the G-band frequency. However, for the suspended bond nitride, it used to be almost uh, strain free, and then after the absorption of the molecule, there was an increase in the strain that caused an upshift of the G-band frequency. And uh, here, so the, 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 the gold dash line, that shows the theoretical uh, strain caused by the conformational change due to the surface absorption of the r molecule that caused the G-band uh, frequency should be here. So that we, we can see that uh, for both substrate bound and suspended bond nitride, after the surface absorption, both of them are kind of going closer to the theoretical strain caused by the molecule. So this, in, this proved that uh, conformation no change uh, does happen in the atomic thing from the trial. And to make this uh, phenomenon more universal, besides for uh, R6G, we also tried uh, different aromatic molecules, so we observed similar trends. Okay, so let's briefly summarize what are the differences between brown nitride and, brown, uh, and graphene. Brown nitride, so they, are, they should, should be strong, and they are more thermally stable, they are electrically insulating, and atomic thin brown nitride, they have better surface absorption than the bulk. Then how can we combine all these properties for application? So one application is we can use atomic thin brown nitride for uh, for very sensitive sensing application. So in this case, we put a double layer, this FM image of a double layer brown nitride covering plas plasmonic active super nanoparticles on silicon oxide. So these are the super nanoparticles, this is covered by brown nitride. Here shows the FM image of the double layer brown nitride, so you can still, you can clearly see like uh, the surface of the nanosheets. And here is the thicker brown nitride covered super nanoparticles. It's about 17 uh, layers, so it's about 5, 6 nanometer thick. So why we do that? There are several purposes. So the first purpose is that uh, we know that uh, with atomic thickness of brown nitride, they are very flexible. So they tend to conform to the surface structure of nanoparticles. This is more, uh, more like a morphology change than the thicker nanosheets. Uh, you may know that uh, for the plasmonic enhancement or effect, its effect decreases uh, exponentially with distance. So that means once the analyte molecules are more closer to the uh, super nanoparticles and the better enhancement you can get. So that means for atomically thin brown nitride, they are atomically thin, so, so that there's almost uh, no decrease in the plasmonic uh, enhancement compared to the bulk. Another thing is uh, uh, gold or super nanoparticles, they are mostly used for the, for the surface enhanced Raman application. And then they are not good in the surface absorption of aromat aromatic molecules. So here, as shown here, brown nitride, they can absorb absorb more molecules than the, uh, the super nanoparticles. So the more analyzed, so that can give you more signals. So as shown here, here is a double layer bond bar nitride. You can still see, clearly see the R6G uh, Raman signal. For the 17 layer, it's uh, much weaker. And for the bulk or uh, bare super nanoparticle on silicon oxide, there was almost no signal. So this is the second reason to, to use brown nitride as a cover. So the third advantage of using brown nitride is during the, the uh, source application, you have to have a laser beam uh, shining at the analyte molecules. And for gold or the super nanoparticles, uh, the photon can introduce some photo uh, degradation of the molecule. So that's why. Without the, the protection of the brown nitride, you can see a lot of uh, 
like a small peaks that's due to the degradation of the molecule that makes the uh, analysis quite difficult. However, with the protection of bone nitride, because they are electrically insulated, so there's no photo degradation, so we get a much cleaner uh, Raman sig signal. And also, uh, homogeneity is a big problem for uh, search application. As you can see here, that uh, the bone nitride covered area, so the signal intensity is quite uh, homogeneous. So another advantage of using brown nitride is just in the case of protection of the copper. And uh, uh, actually, we can re because of brown nitride, we can make the substrates reusable. So that is, uh, for example, for the graphene covered silver nanoparticles, or for the bare uh, silver nanoparticles, or for the one nanometer thick aluminum oxide uh, layer deposited by AOD method. So we, as a, after heating at uh, like a 350 degrees in air, we try to remove the analyte and reuse the substrates. And uh, they are, there was like dramatic decrease in the Raman signal. However, with the protection of the brown nitride, for example, the double layer brown nitride, there was almost uh, <clears throat> no drop in the Raman signal after 30 cycles. So for the most of the third substrates, they are quite expensive uh, to, to produce. So that means that this method can greatly uh, like, uh, improve the reusability of the third substrate for, and for, for sensing. And also we can uh, scale up this uh, substrate by using the CVD brown nitride with a similar uh, effect. So this is another project uh, collaborated with Elton. So one of the most important applications of uh, brown nitride is using as a dielectric substrate for graphene, MOS2, or other 2D materials. And it's very important to study their dielectric properties. Uh, however, because of the small size of brown nitride and also atomic thickness, so the traditional dielectric measurements me uh, method uh, cannot be used. So that's why we use the uh, SPM method. It's based on electric force microscope, or EFM. So during this measurement, we have conductive cantilever, and, uh, and uh, then we apply uh, voltage on the substrate. We try to see how much electric field can pass through bone nitride of different thickness. So here is uh, the FM image uh, morphology of the mechanically exfoliated bone mm -hmm. nitride of different thickness. And this is a EFM face images under the negative or the positive substrate voltage. And then you can see that uh, bone nitride of different thickness give different EFM phase contrast. So that's due to their different capability of dielectric screening. And these are the experimental results, and then we can see slightly shift in the, uh, the, the bottom of the uh, parabolic curve of the EFM uh, data. And there's a different shift, that means the different dielectric uh, screening properties. And uh, here shows the experimental data of bone nitride of different uh, thickness, and then we, we use the uh, nonlinear Thomas Fermi theory to have uh, like a better understanding of this trend. And then we found that uh, we have to include in the interlayer hopping uh, in the process to better uh, explain this dielectric uh, phenomenon. However, uh, this, uh, this theory is not very compatible for the atomically thin layers. So that's why Elton helped with the DFD calculation of atomic thin brown nitride. So, uh, the, the, so, we, so consistent with the experimental results, that we found that there was no dramatic change of the dielectric uh, screening properties of brown nitride of different thickness. And uh, more recently, uh, Elton and I used a similar technique to study the dielectric screening of uh, graphene and MOS2 heterostructures. 
and maybe Elton will uh, talk more about this no, project. You can go ahead, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for any material, mechanical property is a very important uh, property for any applications. And then, uh, we, we used uh, the FM indentation method, as shown here, to study the, the intrinsic property of, uh, of brown nitride. We mechanically exfoliated the brown nitride uh, from the single crystal, uh, HBM crystal, so they are almost uh, defect free and, uh, and the, 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 uh, the grain boundary free. And then we did an indentation over the suspended region, and then here are the indentation curves of one, two, three layer brown nitride. For comparison, these are curves based on graphene of the same thickness. So here summarize the Young's modulus, uh, fracture force, and the strength of brown nitride of different thickness. So the first thing you notice is that uh, brown nitride, they have close mechanical properties to that of graphene, although they are slightly lower. The second thing you may notice is that, for example, for the Young's modulus, the graphene of a uh, with an increase uh, thickness of brown nitride, their Young's modulus is quite steady. There was no much change. However, for bar, for uh, graphene, there was uh, like a slight uh, drop of the Young's modulus with the increased thickness, and then. This happens more obviously for the fracture force. For example, if we use the fracture force of a monolayer brown nitride and multiply the different layer uh, thickness or layer number, and then we have this uh, dashed line projection of how uh, the fracture force should go with the increase of the thickness. So that means for the brown nitride with the increased thickness, it's closely following this projection or prediction. However, for graphene, this is a fracture force of a monolayer graphene. This is a projection or prediction of uh, how the thickness can affect the fracture force. But there was a, a dramatic dif difference here. This, what, this is more clearly reflected in the strengths of a bone nitride graphene of different thickness. So the strengths of bone nitride are very stable, However, for graphene, it dropped a lot to like uh, eight layers. So at eight layers, graphene and brown nitride, they are close in the strengths. So why is that? So Elton will give more insights to explain. And I think that's quite interesting explanation. And uh, uh, so the message is uh, for the brown nitride, it's one of the strongest electrically insulated material we ever discovered, just slightly lower than, than diamond. So very recently, we also studied the thermal conductivity of atomic thin brown nitride. So there have been some uh, studies before, but uh, they have some like two common problems. One was that. Uh, in the previous studies, people use CBD grown bone nitride. So you know that defects or the <coughs> boundaries can greatly affect the thermal conductivity. The second is uh, uh, for the thermal conducti conductivity measurements, we have to get a suspended brown nitride. In previous all previous studies, people use the polymer transfer, uh, PMMA or PMS transfer method. And uh, then this kind of transfer method inevitably give uh, like a polymer uh, contamination on the surface. Because of the atomic thin thickness, so these surface contamination can cause uh, a, a lot of uh, like a, a phonon scattering and reduce the thermal conductivity. So to solve these two problems, we prepared a uh, uh, surface clean uh, brown nitride over uh, the gold coated silicon substrates with holes. So because we use directly exfoliation, so so they are clean. And also the material is similar to the case of the mechanical studies. So these are single crystal line almost defect, defect free. And we used a, a rubber thermal method uh, to get a thermal conductivity. So for the first time, we observed that for the monolayer bone nitride, their thermal conductivity is much higher than the bulk. 
So this is quite different from people uh, concluded before, because in all previous studies, people found that uh, the atomic same bond neutron has a lower semiconductivity. I think that's mainly because of the two problems I mentioned. And also, we observed uh, a slightly uh, drop with uh, uh, increase of the layer thickness. So here compares uh, the thermal conductivities of some common um, in, uh, electrical insulating materials. So you can see that uh, boron nitride it has a higher thermal conductivity than the cubic boron nitride, but lower than those of diamond and uh, the recently discovered cubic boron acid. And also we use the rubber method to study uh, the thermal expansion coefficients of brown nitride energies because no such study have been done before. And uh, so these are the experimental results and these are the theoretical uh, calculation based on Elton's results. So we found that for brown nitride of different thickness, they all have negative thermal expa ex expansion with the increase of time, especially uh, at close to the room temperature region. So that means brown nitride nanosheets, they could be quite useful to produce zero thermal expansion materials. That's quite important for the electronic packaging or for a lot, a lot of uh, like military uh, purposes. So because brown nitride has a non-central uh, symmetry in the crystal structure, so theoretically predicted brown nitride nanosheets they should have uh, like piezo electricity, but this has not been studied before. And now we are trying uh, to study the piezo properties. So probably it's hard to see. There are some uh, monolayer brown nitride here, and then we deposit the electrodes and the charging measure the piezo. And also uh, we invented a large scale, the first large scale production method of uh, brown nitride nanosheets by the bromidine method. And also I studied the, the appeal of photoluminescence uh, of brown nitride of different thickness, the water oil separation application or the tribological applications. And also we can produce high quality brown nitride nanoribbons and then we studied uh, uh, the PLE, photoluminescence <coughs> excitation uh, spectrum, and then we found that the brown nitride nanoribbons, uh, they have uh, like a higher excitonic uh, energy than the nanotubes, probably due to the edge conformance effect. Uh, at the last of the, the talk, I'll briefly introduce a technique uh, called the near edge X ray absorption fine structure, or briefly as Nexus. So actually, I mentioned this technique in the previous slides. And it's a synchrotron-based technique, and uh, I'm a uh, uh, PAC member of the, this uh, soft X-ray beamline at the Australian synchrotron. So we review the proposals and uh, uh, to conduct some experiments at the, the synchrotron. Uh, probably, I don't need to uh, introduce more about the synchrotron. So here is a photo of the Australian signature. So currently it has uh, nine uh, beam lines. So there will be another five or six will be uh, constructed in the next three to four years. <coughs> so how does the uh, Nexus work? Or what information can we get from Nexus? So during the Nexus uh, measurements, we just uh, shine X-ray uh, uh, lights on the material and because of it's a signature, so it's a uh, highly like a polarized X-ray photon and also we can change uh, the photon energy. And then at a certain photon energy, we can excite uh, the 1s core electrons from here to the unoccupied, for example, uh, the pi star orbital or the sigma star orbital. And then in this process, we, there are several, there are three ways, many three ways to detect the, the electron or the photon electron in the process. So in the first method, uh, after the excitation of the core electron and uh, 
and then we can observe the photon electron. So we can measure uh, the current from the sample. And then from that, we can understand the binding energy uh, at the pi star or the sigma star uh, orbital. The second method, we can use a flu uh, fluorescence photon dip detector. Because after the excitation, there's relaxation. And then the, accompanied with the relaxation, there's a, like a photon emitted from the sample. So we can detect the photon as well. So the third method is uh, the OJ process. We can measure the OJ electron. So in the process, maybe the re relaxation not from here to here, but it comes from here to here first and then from here. So in this process, OJ electrons are generated. So we can measure the photon electron, the, the, uh, the, the photon or the fluor fluorescence or the OJ electron. So what information we can get? That can give you very rich uh, chemical bonding information at these levels. For example, here shows the next up spectrum of uh, hexagonal boron nitride and uh, cubic boron nitride. So you can clearly see the difference. For the hexagonal boron nitride, or HBM, there is a strong pi star peak because of the, the existence of uh, uh, sp2 bonding between boron and nitrogen. In contrast, for the cubic boron nitride, there's no sp2 bonding. So there's no pi star orbital. So we only observe the, the, the sigma star mm -hmm. signal. So here we can clearly see the, uh, the chemical bonding or the structure of the crystal. <coughs> so in the second uh, example, it can be used to uh, to probe the orientation of molecules or your crystal. As shown in previously, we can change the incidence angle of the X-ray and we can do some uh, uh, simple like fitting and uh, calculation and then we can uh, tell you like a, in, in a very conformative way that the molecule is most likely in this direction or orientation. So here is a third example. It can also tell you clearly the chemical bond, for example, in the carbon nitride. For example, uh, for the nitrogen here or the nitrogen here, they just give totally different next stops, peaks, or energy. And also here shows uh, the graphite bond mood and a different environment for different, of, different periods of time. So here it shows the nitrogen, the bromelain, done in nitrogen for 20 hours, um, ammonia gas for 5, 20, and 70 hours. And uh, first, you can clearly see that uh, with uh, the increase of the bromelain time or the different uh, atmosphere that give different contents of nitrogen doping in the graphene or the graphite. The second thing, we can do some fitting of the next of spectrum, and it can tell you for example, these three peaks corresponding to three different doping of nitrogen. The first peak, the, the first peak corresponds to the pyridinic nitrogen in the graphite. So the second one is pyrolic, the third one is graphitic. So it can give you detailed chemical bonding information. In this case, the nitrogen, uh, the bow milled products from nitrogen gas. Besides these three, different nitrogen doping peaks, you can also see some vibronic peaks. And this peak corresponding to uh, the gas phase of nitrogen. So that means even after bone milling exposed, uh, exposed to air, there are still some nitrogen gas molecules trapped in the bone milled graphite. So that gives a very unique vibronic peaks. So that can tell you a lot of information. So that brings uh, the end of the talk. So if you uh, are interested in the bone nitride or interested in the next half study, and maybe we can talk more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. for this uh, very comprehensive overview on bone nitride. And are there any questions for Luwa? Uh, two questions. The first one is related with uh, when you said that the, in the oxidation tests for copper, you used the CBD boron nitride. 
Is it, uh, it does, does, does that mean that if you use uh, exfoliated boron nitro, you would maybe not find this problem of quality? And so have you tried it or is there a way? Oh, we haven't tried the exfoliated boron nitride for the protection purpose. Uh, the main reason is that exfoliated uh, flakes, you know, they are relatively small. So for this, in the case of CVD, uh, the boron nitride can completely cover the surface of the copper. And if the size of bond nitride is small, there still could be uh, oxygen <coughs> diffusing um, at the uncovered area and then goes through under the bond nitride. And it would be possible, for example, um, to evaporate, ev evaporate uh, small spots of copper and then cover it with, uh, with a flake of boron nitride, for example? Yes, I think that's definitely possible. Uh, but I think uh, we not go in that direction because two reasons. One is I think our study already clearly showed the importance of the quality of brown nitride uh, in the protection. The second thing is uh, uh, for the real application, uh, the exfoliated material not useful. Yeah. Well, uh, the second one was just uh, the bulk milling process. I am not familiar right, with it. Could you just uh, okay. say something about it? Okay, so you may know that there are several methods that can, can produce light quantities of graphene. For example, the Hummer or the oxidation or the high, high temperature expansion method uh, or the liquid exfoliation. However, for bond nitride, these methods are uh, not really working well. And uh, what we do is uh, in the bond milling process, normally bond milling is part of a high energy impact between the ball and the wall of the, the milling jar. And that mostly destroys the crystal structure, give you kind of amorphous or semi-amorphous uh, material. However, in this case, we know to the, for the 2D materials, there is a relatively weak uh, uh, value interaction among the layers. So we use special conditions in the ball milling so that we, we didn't create a high energy impact. Instead, we let the ball just rotating uh, in the ball milling jar. So, because of this kind of friction, it's mainly uh, exfoliate the 2D materials in instead of like uh, uh, destroying them. So, actually, we are the first uh, uh, group like using this method to produce uh, atomic thin nanosheets, and then later people use similar method for the production of graphene and graphene. Can that? Yes. Uh, why you why you have kind of observations are in the exact uh, uh, spectrum of the observations after the end? Um, so yeah, you're you asking about this? You only have observations due to the uh, near the main. Why there is a oscillation? Why there is no oscillation? Uh, they, they are, just so it's uh, too small to see. So actually we I use the uh, five different peaks of uh, like uh, the, the, sim the, the same like the distance in the fitting. So there are five peaks here. They just have different intensity, but uh, the energy separation is almost the same. No progress. Yeah, so you are saying that the uh, bottom matter is highly insulating, right? That's one bad with your or of course for graphene or other 2D materials like they always do. So by doping like uh, for the extent you can uh, decrease that uh, band gap. Okay. Um, doping can reduce the band gap of power nitride. And so one of what, to what extent? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so the, the most uh, promising or the most studied uh, doping is carbon. Uh, so theoretically, if you have a, a doping of carbon at a certain location in the boron nitride, you can reduce its uh, band gap to about 2 or 2.5 eV. However, experimentally, it's very hard to achieve. Uh, the main reason is uh, when people try to dope uh, carbon, instead of, for example, the carbon in a separated uh, doping size in boron nitride, the carbon tends to agglomerate. So as a result of the doping, it's more likely to observe like one area of pure carbon, another area of pure bone nitride. So that means you cannot get the theoretically predicted uh, small band gap. Okay. Uh, 
The, the Gobi not homogeneous, yes. The, the carbon like to get together and the bone archive like to get together. So instead you get a, a, a gram of graphene, a gram of bone archive. And uh, can you please comment like how they are an advantage as compared to MOS2 or some other uh, transition metal dichotomy, like something like that, that other 2D materials? Uh, so it's uh, still, it's basically they are different properties. As I said, bone archive is, is more mechanically uh, like strong than MOS2, it's more stable than MOS2, and uh, uh, it has better arom aromatic uh, molecule absorption. And uh, I think uh, you can find uh, suitable applications according to these properties. But it has uh, like application in terms of optical properties, it has a lag, right? If you compare MOS2. Uh, it's not left or so. there's no better or worse. For example, for bone nitride, because of its uh, large band gap, so you can get a uh, strong DUV, deep ultraviolet uh, photoluminescence out of bone nitride. So at around 217 nanometer. <coughs> right? So because they have different band gap, so give you the photoluminescence uh, of different uh, photo energy. So, and then there are different applications. So that means for MOS2, for its appeal, it's mostly in the visible range. So you can see them. But for the bone nitride, uh, there are groups trying to use bone nitride uh, to produce a uh, DUV laser. <coughs> so that kind of laser is very useful, for example, for lithography. So because the, the short wavelengths and the higher resolution you can get. So they have different uh, purposes or applications. There's no good or bad. Regarding the measuring of the dielectric screening, not to measure exactly the static dielectric constant of the atomically thin bone and how is it possible that it doesn't go to a very small value for a layer? So we use the EFM method. So again, in this method, we have conductive or it's a gold coated. FM can deliver. And uh, also, we have the substrate with bone nitride up. And then the substrate is mainly the doped silicon, so we can consider that, that as electrical conductive. And then we apply voltage either uh, to the substrate or to the cantilever. So you can imagine, because of the difference in the voltage, there will be a uh, electric field between the cantilever and the substrate, right? And then, uh, because of electric field, and then there will be like a different uh, uh, dielectric screening capability of bone nitride of different signals. And then that difference can be reflected in the FM or EFM phase image. So you can imagine, if a material it has a better dielectric uh, constant uh, or dielectric splitting property, and then the cantilever will feel less force. And if there is a uh, like a bad dielectric uh, screening, and then it will feel more force. So it's basically SPM method. So we determine the dielectric screening property based on how much force or the electric field the cantilever can feel. So, uh, but we cannot get uh, the quantified dielectric constant out of this method. So it can only give you quanti quantitative data. So we can only uh, compare, for example, brown nitride of different thickness, how their dielectric screening change, but these are not quantified constants. Uh, however, now uh, Elton and I, uh, and also Alexi, we use another uh, SPM method. It's called a SMIM. And by using the SMIM method, we can quantify the dielectric constant of different 2D materials. And we studied 10 different 2D materials of different thickness. And uh, the preliminary uh, analysis showed that with a reduction of thickness, there, there is a, like a clear 
change in the dielectric constant of the same material. Okay, we can keep discussing during the break. So uh, there'll be like a 20-minute break before the next talk. Let's thank uh, Lufua again. Thank you.